going here. Okay, so um, you recall that the last time we talked, um, we were talking about um, testing. And we were talking about how testing is, in a certain way, it's a, it's a type of, um, of, of risk management. You're trying to put, you can't test everything. It, for, for virtually any practical system, you're not going to be able to do exhaustive testing on it. You can't test every possible thing. So you've got to be, you have limited resources. There's opportunity costs. If you put your effort into testing A, you won't be able to test B. Because of this, you should put your effort into testing the most valuable types of things. The types of things will get you the biggest bang for the buck. And we talked about several ways of achieving that two lectures ago with things like um, uh, equivalence class testing, only testing a few things in each equivalence class, you know, testing a few negative numbers with square root, testing a few exact primes with square root and a few things that are not exact primes, right? Um, you, you, we also talked about boundary value testing, picking things that are at the boundary between equivalence classes, right? Um, we further talked about orthogonal arrays. The idea is we can't test often all possible configurations, particularly if it's something that has to be manually configured. Um, testing thousands of configurations may be a non-starter, but if you could test pairwise all possible OSs and browsers and all possible browsers uh, with, with, pair in, or with plugins, even if you don't examine all possible combinations of all three, you're doing pretty well, because most problems are pairwise. But something we started to talk about last time was this issue of um, choosing our test judiciously, carefully, to get the biggest bang for the buck using the city of coverage testing. And here we depicted our system in a sort of graph. Edges and nodes, right? The edges go between nodes. And we saw that we could do this at the high level, like this. This is you know, a diagram for an ATM, where we have these states, and we, you have these transitions between states. But we could also do it at the low level, where we have basic blocks of code, and we have transitions among basic blocks of code. These are basic blocks in the sense that if you reach the beginning, you're going to reach the end. You, you, they're sort of these indivisible blocks of code. Um, and the idea was if we conceptualize our system, whether at a high level, black box, or at a low level, glass box, we could undertake what's called coverage testing. Now, coverage testing exists at different levels and different forms. And we're going to be talking about several of them. But they all share certain characteristics. And these are the basic steps of coverage testing, whether it's path coverage or logic coverage, whether it's node coverage within path coverage or, or transition coverage, we're first identifying a set of things we want to cover. For our cases, it can be nodes and transitions and prime paths today. But other, in other cases, it, it could be features having to do with the logical um, the different values of, of Boolean variables, for example. So we identify what we want to cover. So we say, here are the nodes of our graph. Here are the edges of our graph. Or here are the prime paths. And then we develop a set of paths through there that will cover these things. Paths from start to finish that will collectively cover the set of things we want to cover. Okay? So that's this abstract scenarios. Here, for path-based testing, it's paths. It would be something different for logic-based testing. So here, for example, maybe we want to achieve state coverage. So the things we want to cover are these states, right? But we figure out abstract paths, paths through the system that will cover all the things we want to cover. And I've shown three such paths, right? right. This is from Ammon and uh, from Copeland's book, rather. So that's good. That's good. We, 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 we have these abstract paths. But that's not the end. What do we have to do beyond delineating these abstract paths? What do we have to do to turn it into something that we can do? What do we have to come up with? Test cases. Yeah, we have to come up with specific concrete test cases. 
And these concrete test cases are very specific. They're totally non-ambiguous, so they can be totally reproducible. We can, we have a complete specification of what we want to test. We, we click here, we click there, we enter this or this input field, we pick this and this drop down, we submit in this way, etc. In a way that's, we, we, it's minimally ambiguous so that it can be very reproducible. So if we find a bug, why does it help if it's reproducible? So if a tester finds a bug, what can happen then? They can just go through the steps to see if that bug is fixed. If yeah. That bug is, you know, Great. If someone claims it's fixed, the developer says, oh, the, I fixed that last, you know, I, I've now fixed that, they can check. And the developer can also reproduce it and debugging it, right? So we have to develop a set of concrete test cases. I mean, this is all nice and good. We, we have abstract paths through this, so we want to test this path, we want to test this path, we want to test this path. But then the question is, how do we test it? What particular input is going to get it to go this way? How are we going to achieve it to go this way, right? Um, and that's what we, where we have to come up with concrete test cases. Remember this from last time? We have to come up with concrete strings here very specific input that will get it to go a certain way. And we talked last time about some trade-offs. You know, maybe you want, in some cases you want one string, once it runs through, you know it's tested all of these different places. Maybe in other cases, in order for it to be easy to debug, we want very short strings, so we'll test kind of a minimum path through here so that if there's an error, we know where it is. We can zero in on it, for example, right? And it's quick to do. It's, it's quick to undertake. There's less risk of human error in undertaking. So these are these concrete test cases that I'm talking about here. They, they get it to go certain ways so you achieve these paths. Does that make sense? Is that basic understanding there? Now, this basic understanding, whole, regardless of whether we're talking about achieving state coverage, or whether we're talking about achieving coverage at a higher level, uh, transition coverage, for example. We figure out what we want to cover, their states. We figure out abstract paths through them, great. And then we try to figure out how are we going to exercise these things, right? Okay, good. So we may have something like this, and we figure out, okay, I have two abstract test cases that I'm gonna go that try to figure, uh, that bring it through the system like this, okay? Now there's a fly in the ointment that I'm not gonna get into right yet, um, but maybe at the end of today's class, I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay, so what is state coverage? The idea behind state coverage is look, we want the paths to, to reach each node in the graph, each vertex in the graph, at least once. Um, and so, you know, here's state coverage, right? Here are a bunch of vertices. We have vertices and edges between them. Here are the vertices. And we want to achieve paths that will cover each of these at least once. Our test cases need to reach each of these at least once, right? So maybe it's that for that, or we have this, right? We want to achieve, get to each of these blocks at least once. Whatever our test cases are, we want them to hit each block. Does that make sense? Okay, now, sounds nice. That's what Jay was talking about last time. Remember he said statement coverage? That's what that is. It's reaching each of these statements, which you could think of as associated with these basic blocks, at least once. It's good. It's certainly better than not reaching anything. Why would I say it's, it's kind of, can, can, you, can you be really very, very confident that your system is devoid of bugs if, if you uh, haven't reached each statement at, at least once? No. It's hard to be confident because who knows, the statements you haven't reached could have a bug in them, right? Let me ask this, let me flip that around. If you did reach each statement at least once, could there still be bugs in your system? Yes. Why is that? Because the way to get those statements might be bugged. 
good. It may be different ways of getting there might be problematic. And that's why we actually say state coverage is the simplest and the weakest criteria. It's actually a quite weak criteria. I'll we'll come back to that. And in general, even if we're talking about higher levels of this subsumption hierarchy, even prime path coverage, whether a bug exists or not may also depend on something besides where we're going. It may depend on aspects of the data. Maybe we go the same way, but with different data, it bombs out. Some data, it works. So it's actually not true that if we have prime path coverage, even this very high level of coverage, that we're guaranteed to be beyond bugs, by no means. It could be with different input, it'll crash. But if we don't have at least node or ever edge coverage, we're embarrassingly exposed or embarrassingly vulnerable to problems. It's like we haven't even done our basics. We don't even have, you know, some sort of, we can't even pass the red face test. <laughs> Up here, we can pass the red face test, but there could still could be vulnerabilities, okay? Okay, now, I say that it's simplest and weakest. What's so weak about state coverage? Well, Jesse uttered it earlier. Maybe you hit all the states, but you haven't tested what, Jesse? You haven't tested the, ways to get to the different ways to get there. And the common problem here is that code works fine based on one path by which you hit these things, but it fails on another path. So a classic thing here is you have a variable that's left uninitialized on one path or something that's null on one path. So here. You may be the last generation of students here who I can count on knowing C reasonably well, um, or at least being fairly acquainted with C, but right? In C, you can have this thing called a null pointer. Remember that? Well, actually, in Java, it's what we call a null reference, right? But either way, um, you can have something be null. And maybe one way through this code, if you take this so-called consequent here, if, if the if is true, you assign that to be an actual memory memory location that points to something valid. But if you don't hit the if, the consequent here, it's still null. And then you hit this place and bad things happen if it's null, right? So here, you could achieve statement coverage. You, you go here, you, you hit this, and this works fine. But if you come this other way, bad things happen. Do you see that? So it might say statement coverage. Yeah, if I execute this and I execute this and I execute this, things work hunky-dory, it's all fine and good. But there's still this big vulnerability because we haven't captured the different ways we can get there, as Jesse said. Right. So the next level up from this in this subsumption hierarchy is edge coverage or transition coverage. I use the terms interchangeably, okay? Now, I introduced the subsumption hierarchy last time. Does anyone remember, what does it mean, the fact that edge coverage is kind of above and strictly, strictly above in the sense that it, it would connect? It, it, it would contain yeah, it that. That. yeah, that's right. It contains everything that says no coverage is contained in edge coverage. But edge cover, it actually covers more. It, it's stronger. It takes care of everything node coverage does, but it takes care of a greater set of things, okay? Um, so you're guaranteed to get node coverage with edge coverage, but you have extra strengths of guarantees, okay? Turns out there's a lot of things in computing like that. So, so it turns out everything we can represent with a regular expression, you folks learned about regular expression, 214? Yes. Yeah. So everything you can do with the right expression, you can do with a grammar. Um, but there's a lot of things you can do with a grammar that you can't do with a regular expression, okay? Um, same thing with a Turing machine. You can do anything you can with a grammar or with a regular expression with a Turing machine, but not vice versa, okay? So these subsumptions. There are certain things that are more powerful than other things. Often they take more resources too, okay? So what we're gonna talk about is transition or edge-based testing. Okay, now here, the basic idea is simple. We're exercising all transitions in the code at least once, okay? So here, 
rather than testing just state-based coverage like this, here we're, we're reaching each state, but what's not being covered? This is state coverage. What's not, give me something that's not covered in state coverage here. Cancel and refund? Yeah, cancel refund here. We've never tested it where a customer wants to cancel and whether they get refunded. That's pretty scary. We've never tested that. But with transition coverage, we cover all transitions, so we have to cover that, right? We have to cover that state by which you could you could get here. Okay, um, so here, a particular edge may be covered by many states. I mean, after all, can you tell me what's uh, what are several edges here on these abstract paths that cover a given transition? I, I said here, there are many test paths that may cover a particular edge. What's, uh, even among these, these sort of abstract test paths, these abstract paths here, which ones are several that go over the same basic transition? Um, well, they all go over the initial state and then... Okay, but how about uh, this initial transition, for example? Right, yeah, a lot of them have to at least pay. Yeah, like yeah these, these three actually all need to go via this. It's not to say we, we only test this with one. No, we test it with, but at least every edge is at least tested by one, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and for each path, we have to find specific situation we'll exercise in, right? That, that was true with, with state coverage too. But here, we're doing, we're doing it with transitions being the focus. We have to have a way to to get it to cover that. And um, we do have to watch out for and reject paths that are impossible. This will come up and I'll come back to this, okay? Turns out sometimes we may say, we need to go this way and it's not possible. We can't logically have it go that way, okay? Um, okay, now what are the testing gaps here? So transition coverage sounds great, but what things are we not covering? It turns out this is a lot better than state coverage, but there's some things that are not not handled. We're not testing cases where we might not be able to go through any of the paths, like invalid input, for example. Oh, okay. Generally, that would lead to an error state, say, from the start transition or something like that. Let, let's think about this case. Let's think about it. I'd like you to draw your attention to something like L here. Mm -hmm. um, actually, L is not a great example. How about something like, yeah, this, this uh, B. What do we have in B? Well, okay, there's a pointer, but, but there's something else that's going on here. Okay, so with edge coverage, I need to have at least one test case that tests this, at least one that tests this, the test this, and the test this, right? Mm -hmm. What I haven't done is done what? Combinations of them. I haven't said, okay, I need one, at least one where it comes in this way, say it comes in this way and it goes this way. Another one where it comes in this way and goes this way. Another one where it comes in this way and goes this way. Another where it comes in this way and goes this way, which would be stronger yet because it's testing sort of combinations of ways you could arrive and ways you could leave, right? Um, so, so, so instead yeah. Instead of testing each path once, we test combinations of input and output. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's something transition coverage by itself does not do. Transition coverage just tests each transition is covered at least once. And what I'm saying is it can miss things that are caused where you haven't covered combinations of transitions. So maybe, maybe this code works, for example, um, if you uh, have foo being true. Um, maybe, maybe this code works for all cases except foo is true and bar is false. In that case, it fails. And transition cover just says, well, at least one test where foo is true, at least one where it's false at least one where bar is true, at least one where it's false, but it doesn't force you to try all possible combinations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, but it is a big improvement. Take a look at this. You know, state, uh, state first is transition coverage. Uh, this is node coverage or state coverage. And this is transition coverage. What thing would cover states here but would not achieve transition coverage? If you want, you could look at what they're saying here about the paths. But, but tell me, which things would cover, what thing, if I tried it, what path, remember this is about paths here, what path would achieve state coverage or what collection of paths would achieve state coverage but not node coverage, excuse me, not edge coverage? You only have to test the one where x is less than y. Yeah, because there we go. This, this, and this, we're done. Does that achieve state uh, transition coverage? No. No. Why? What is not tested? The other path. This other path. So for transition coverage, you, yes, you'll do great to cover that. That's n0, n1, n2. But you'll also need to cover for transition coverage what? The path where it's, x is greater than or equal to. Yeah, n0, n2. Do you appreciate that? So this is like an if statement, right? right. It's an if, and if it's true, we do n1. Otherwise, we just fall through, right? Yeah. So. So edge coverage here is stronger than that. It requires more testing, right? But it does not cover multiple paths in all possible combinations, okay? That would require what's called transition tuple coverage, which is stronger yet. But transition coverage is a lot better than state coverage. And some path, some tools allow you to, to achieve that. If I'm not mistaken, Istanbul provides both statement coverage statistics and transition coverage statistics, which is great. A lot of tools have traditionally only done state-based coverage, okay? But Istanbul with JavaScript does both, okay? Okay, now, I said earlier, just a few slides ago, sometimes you need to watch out and reject paths that are impossible. You can't find a test case. You can't possibly come up with a test case. Even though they seem to be required by transition coverage in theory, they're not in fact plausible. Therefore, you don't have to worry about them. Let's consider a case. Yeah. So an example of that is the, the null pointer we have. If, if we called it immediately, if we called the if uh, value equals null, like if we said value equals null exactly after, there's no point where a transition could be feasible there, right? If we had done, you're saying this guy here? Yeah, so if we just said, so immediately after, there's no code after. If we said if p head equals null, yeah. call that. They're like reasonably, you right. would say that there wouldn't be a transit, like it has to do that. Right, you're, you're saying, okay, very good point. So you're saying if there had been an if here, for example, right. that tested if p hat is null, then do something else. Right. Then it would have to be that it will either go this way or it will go that way, yeah. logically. Or, or if like, That's right, Jesse. Or if, for example, if you had p hat equals null and then immediately after the transit, like the if is immediately after and it checks if p hat is null, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then... There's yeah. nothing else it can do. Right? Th that's right. That's right. So yeah, you've, you've got the basic point, I think, which is okay. there are times that the structure of the code enforces things, makes them correct, right. or, or causes it to be impossible and you don't have to worry about it for other reasons. Right. So, so here's an example. This is, this is of a high level real world system. And you'll notice that these various conditions and Jesse, again, was on to it with conditions here. So here's a request. So I've described here in blue, green, yellow, and red, abstract paths through this system, paths that will accept, um, that, that need to be achieved to achieve what sort of coverage uh, do these things uh, do, 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 
Oops, there is a missing, there's a missing one of them here. Other than this, what does this achieve? It achieves what? Transition. Transition coverage, yeah, I've, I've, I've missed one there. But there's a problem here logically, because one of these abstract, remember these are abstract paths, they're just based on the connections. I want, I'm, I'm trying to, remember the whole point of state, of these, of these, um, uh, of, 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 uh, of coverage procedure, we find abstract scenarios, right? And then we've got to find these concrete test cases that will exercise these, that will traverse them. Abstract scenarios are all nice, nice and good. You know, we'll say we'll go this way and it will cover all these things we want to cover, the nodes, the transitions. But the problem with abstract scenarios, sometimes we define them at a higher level that, that actually sometimes it turns out they can't be reached. So take a look at this. What's the problem? with path number that's red. What's the problem with path red? If you, if you go through the transitions, why do I say I don't have to worry about red as a path, big red? Why do I not have to worry about that as a possibility, this use case or this scenario? What's, what's not consistent about Big red. Oh, uh, the, you have to be that the number is a US or EU resident, but it's unable to repair and it's not a US or EU. Exactly. So this is logically impossible. That someone would would wait for pickup because it, they have to be a US or EU resident for this case. And then down here, we'll take a path where it's only applicable if they're not US or EU resident. Now, you might say, well, this is a path through the diagram. Yes, but it's a logically impossible path. And as Jesse had indicated before, we don't have to, if it's logically impossible, the system will prevent it from, from doing that, and we don't have to test it. Does that make sense? So red is something which you might come up with if you were to just look at the, these as arrows and nodes and ignore the conditions. But it's not, in fact, a possible thing, so we don't have to worry about it. And what if we tried to come up with a test case to do this? Would we succeed? Remember, the idea is with concrete test cases, we have to make each of these paths be realized. Well, we have to figure out a way to exercise this path. If, if we assume it's written correctly, we won't yeah. succeed. Yeah, we won't succeed. We'd say, well, what, what particular type of situation? OK, the, a person calls from the US. And if they go from the US, then we can't possibly get it to go this way. A lot of these things with these test cases, these te types of test cases we showed here, is you're trying to get, get it to go a certain way. And at some point, it could be impossible to get it to go that way. In which case, you could say, OK, this is not possible. We don't have to worry about testing this. Does that make sense? Right. So, so the idea here is sometimes, you do have to consider the conditions. And this is what I think Jesse was getting at about that testing if it's null, for example. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a key point here that just doing it on the basis of transitions themselves, like reason about these transitions, hides the fact that sometimes there's conditions associated with them. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so. Um, is, is it fair to say, though, that like, it might be worth testing if you if assume it shouldn't happen and maybe it is happening. Like, like it's, it's more a logical error on the code part. Like, you look at the code mm -hmm. and it's not, it shouldn't happen, but maybe it is happening somehow. E yeah, it, that, that can be an indication of a failure in the code. Right. Um, it, so that's important to notice for reporting a bug. But I would say that, that we, we can't really formulate a test to get it to do something that's impossible. Right. You know, um, if it, um, we can't plan around having a test that will get it to do something that it shouldn't do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we should, certainly if it's doing something that's logically inconsistent, um, then we should report that as a problem. Okay. I don't, does that, that makes perfect sense. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 
most of these examples that I've shown today have been for what I call black box testing, right? It's, and what is black box testing? Why do I distinguish it from glass box? Why is this black box? You don't see the code. Yeah, yeah. We don't okay. Know okay, we don't see the code. We don't know how it's doing it. All we know is what is supposed to happen at each of these steps. Our focus is on the what, not the how. The how, in terms of the details of the code, are hidden. That can be valuable, right? Because often the what will change less quickly than the how. Algorithms get rewritten. Code will get refactored. Functions that were one function before get split into different functions. And sometimes code that tests them directly breaks. The tests break because they no longer compile and they have to be written against the refactored code, right? But the UI sometimes will persist. Conversely, I would actually argue sometimes the UI evolves the quickest. <laughs> and so you want UI tests that are less, um, less tied down by the details of the UI. But my point here is that we can, we can achieve this sort of testing that we've been discussing at a high level for lower level testing, okay? And here, we are using knowledge of the structure of the code um, and are running it through there. So um, uh, here, we're doing things like this. And we've seen this a bit, right? With low level code, and we reached it about statement level or, or transition level, level coverage. So we go from this to this, and we reason about the coverage. Now, both these sorts of testing are applicable to your code. There are places where I do each, and there's places where I wouldn't do each. For example, what's a thing where you might do this sort of testing? against low-level code. What, what would be a, a tempting place to do this sort of testing? CRUD operation, possibly? Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, possibly, you know, key, key operations associated with getting the data into the database or retrieving it from the database, potentially. I would say core key algorithms and code, particularly tricky ones, which were tricky to code, you might really want to do this. You know, cases where you're testing, I mean, a sort of trivial, simple case would be you're testing your um, quicksort. You want to be sure you tested going either way on that if statement. But maybe you have a, a really nice, fancy algorithm for a all pair shortest path or something like that and you want to test to make sure that it works properly. Uh, or you have a computational geometry algorithm to find the k nearest, k nearest points to your point. And you want to make, and the code is kind of complex and you want to make sure it works properly on every condition. Some of these algorithms are really sweet, but they're, they're tricky and you've got to get things exactly right. Not you know less than or equal, but less than. It's got to be exactly correct. And doing this sort of testing, statement level, transition level can be really valuable, especially transition level. So that's good. When wouldn't you do this? Well, there's a lot of small routines that are pretty straightforward, and you might not have the time to do this. UI testing, when's a good time to do UI testing? Test. UI. <laughs> to okay, test. okay to test but. Do the user inputs, right? Okay, yeah, so especially structured user inputs. So what I mean by structured is things like um, you have a fields and you have a form. What, what's an example of UI testing where UI based testing, by UI based testing, I mean sort of um, testing if it's worked based on 
feedback from the UI might be challenging. Well, free form, more free form stuff like a like a sketch program might be might be a little bit difficult to test from the results on the UI. Or, you know, one example we've run a number of projects now is Oculus, you know, the Oculus. Doing UI testing based on how the view looks after you do a certain operation, it can be kind of challenging to compare the view with what should have been. Now there's another, other things you could do to test at the system level, testing the code that generates that view and so on, but actually testing how the image looks is a little bit difficult. And in general, things which have a lot of rendering and so on can be difficult. There's this whole move towards snapshot testing, which is basically taking pictures, like a screenshot, after you do something at C gets the same, and that can be good, but if the, if the resulting image differs because of other things, you know, if during the time of day it adjusts it for brightness or something, it's gonna be really hard to do that. So there are times where UI testing based on the GUI output can be challenging. Um, okay. Um, now we're going to go on and talk about prime path testing. And judge, judging by the time here, we're probably going to have to finish this next time. Okay, but this is a type of testing that's notably stronger than node coverage. It's stronger than edge coverage, and it's stronger than edge pair coverage, which I talked about, where you come in for pairs of edges. Remember that. And it's based on some concepts from, from graph theory that have to do with prime paths and a type of path they're defined in terms of called a simple path, okay? Okay, so the basic, it's easy to get lost in the basic procedure, but I wanna emphasize it's the same basic deal as we saw before. So we identify a set of things we want to cover. Here it's prod paths. Then we define a set of scenarios that are going to cover them. These are going to be paths, these abstract paths. Now, the thing that, get, that gets students confused sometimes is what we're trying to cover here are not nodes. They're not transitions. They're paths themselves. Okay, so we're trying to, we're gonna be coming up with abstract paths that cover paths, okay? Um, it's it's kind of like here we were trying to cover transitions, here we we're covering states, but in this new case, we're gonna be covering paths, paths through the system, okay? Those paths are themselves not going to be complete transitions through the system and any one path abstract path we're going to use to cover them is going to go from start to a finish okay but we're, we're going to cover them okay so these are going to be from start to finish that are going to cover our paths the prime paths okay so we're going to need to to figure out what the prime paths are that we want to cover earlier it was easy we want to cover nodes well they're really obvious we want to cover transitions, they're really obvious. But once we get into pairs of transitions, or once we get into prime paths, we've got to we've got to figure out what they are in a more careful way and and then cover them with these abstract paths. And then finally, we're going to come up with concrete test cases that cover those paths. Okay, concrete test cases that are defined with very specific input that will exercise these abstract paths. That will cause it to go that way, cause it to go the other way. And just as any specific one of these paths that we saw earlier, like any specific one of these paths covered here multiple nodes, multiple states, right? 
Any one of these abstract paths is going to cover multiple prime paths. That's fine. That's great. So we may have a lot fewer abstract paths we're going to be reaching than we do prime paths. We're going to have a bunch of prime paths we have to cover, and we're going to have a set of, of abstract paths that will cover all those prime paths. And we're going to have to figure out concrete inputs, these sort of things that will, that will get those abstract paths to reach the appropriate places they have to reach. Does that make sense? So we're going to get the user to enter certain things to reach that point. Or we're going to give it as input to the function parameters. Okay? This is the idea. Students get, one of the reasons I'm emphasizing this, because it's easy to get thrown off. We're going to be spending a while, how do we derive the prime paths? And it's easy for students to think those are the paths through the system that we're going to be running in our test cases. No, those are the things that the test cases are going to be covering. Hmm? I'm glad you're here to hear this in person. Eh? Um, I'm not sure you're glad, but <laughs> how do you show me? Okay, so um, here we go. Um, so prime paths. So let me just describe what I mean by prime path. To describe what I mean by prime path, I actually need to describe what I mean by something even simpler. It's something called a simple path. Okay? All prime paths are going to be simple paths, but they're going to be special simple paths. They're going to be sort of big, irreducible simple paths. So, unfortunately, the computer's not going to capture this, but I'm going to show some prime paths on the board. Okay? So a prime path exists when we have a graph and we have edges between the nodes. So we're going to have here maybe some nodes A, B, C, D here, okay? And uh, we're going to have here uh, E and D will go to E, and this can go to F, okay? And C can go to F as well. Put it like that, okay? Um, and then you can go back from E to A, okay? So, a simple path, as, as it says on the board, a simple path, so th first of all, we have to think about paths, right? There's, there's paths from one vertex in here to another vertex, for example. We can have paths which represent traversals through this graph from one point to the other, right? Mm. Um, I'll put a, put a note there. So give me a path. Give me a path here. Some path. A, C, E. Okay, A to C to E. Okay, it's a path, for example. Right? Is that a simple path by the definition up there? So I say a path through this graph from node A to node B is a simple path if it does not contain any repeated nodes except possibly A equals B. So is that a simple path, the one suggested by Jesse? That is a simple path, indeed. That's a simple path. Give me another simple path. F, D, E, A. F, D, E, A is another one. Good. F to D, E to A is another one. How do we know it's a simple path? First of all, it's a path. You can get to each node successively in it through a valid transition. And it contains no repeated nodes except for well, if, if the first equals the last. So this is a simple path. Now give me a simple path that does contain a repeated node. A, C, E, A. A, C, E, A. That is correct. 
A to C to E to A. Now, what's the repeated node here? A. Okay. And why is that legal? Because the first, only the first one equals only the last one. That's right. So in a simple path, it's basically a path without any repeats, or with the exception, the first can be equal to the last. Right? That's okay. But that's the only type of repeat that's allowed, right? Right. Okay. So that too is a simple path. Give me another one with a repeat. F D E F. Good. F D E F. Okay, so you're getting you're getting the idea here. These have repeats, but the repeats are 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 limited to just the first and the last, right? Are relegated to the first and the last. Give me something that's not a simple path. Give me a path that's not a simple path. F D E F D. Good. F D F D E what? F D E F D. And why is that not a simple path? That's repeated. That's right. F is repeated, but it's not the end. And yeah, the o go. the only way it can be repeated is if it's at the beginning and end. And here it's not. It's internally. So this is not a simple path. Give me one more. A C E A C D. Okay. So here's a marathon one. E C. What is it? E C. C A C. He doesn't go to C. E E A C. Oh, E A C. Okay. E A C. Okay. Good. E A C. E F D. E F D. Okay. And why do we know that's not a simple path? Because E is in the middle and not at the end. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so so this is. Uh, here we have a repeat that's not at the end. Okay, so that's a simple path, right? Um, now, you may say, well, that's kind of a strange thing. Sure, there are these things called simple paths. Turns out that they're kind of building blocks. Any path can be composed out of simple paths. We can, they're kind of building blocks for, for uh, larger structures. We can build a larger structure out of them, okay? Um, uh, and as such, they provide a way of kind of describing a larger graph like this one. We can, we can describe it in terms of simple paths. But the, the issue is that there's a lot of different ways we can describe it. There's a lot of different choices we have. You folks were able to come up with them like this because it's really easy to pick them out of here, right? B by itself is a simple path. B D is a simple path. B D E is a simple path. There's there's lots of these things and they have lots of repetition. So I'm going to talk about a very specific type of simple path. Okay, it's called a prime path. Okay, a prime path is a simple path, but it's a very specific simple path. Okay, it's kind of a Not quite an irreducible simple path, but you can think of it as, as kind of like it's kind of like it. It's it's a simple it's a simple path that's not a subpiece of any other simple path. It's kind of a maximal simple path almost. It, it's a maximum length path that doesn't create any contain any repetition of loops. Okay. Um, so a prime path is a simple path, but it's one that's that's not contained in any other. It's kind of a it's a big natural chunk, um, and it often can't grow larger, else it would repeat something. And if it were smaller, it'd be contained in something else. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. So prime paths are what we're going to be deriving here. Okay. 
So we're going to be figuring out here with prime paths how to identify the prime paths in a graph. Before, we, we tried to cover nodes, for example, in our testing, right? Or we tried to cover transitions. Here, we're going to be, those were kind of evident. We could just look at it and we'd find them, right? Here, we're going to look at what we're trying to test and we're going to derive the prime paths, okay? We're going to derive the prime paths that are in there. Just like before we want to cover the nodes, here we want to cover the prime paths. Does that make sense? That's not to get confused with the second step. We're going to still come up with these paths from start to finish that will cover these prime paths. But the things we want to cover are prime paths. Just like before we want to cover nodes, we want to cover transitions. Here we're trying to cover prime paths. Okay? Okay. Um, so, for example, here. Here are two graphs. Um, and zero, and one, and two, and, and three. Okay? Um, so, some prime paths for each of those are given there. Can anyone identify some prime paths through that first graph? Yeah, and, and zero, zero and well, not and, and, three. and two, right? Oh, and three, yeah, sorry. It's, it's a little bit hard. Okay. Again, I should hand out Tanaka. Um, or what's another prime path through this one? And zero and two and three. And three. That's 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 good. How about how about this one to the right? What are some prime paths through or what are what are some simple paths through that? Give me a simple path. Uh, and zero and one. Is that a simple path? No. Why not? Because it doesn't, it can keep going. Right? Well, and one was repeated. And one was repeated. It's oh, not at right. the beginning. It's not the beginning, right? Give me a, a simple path then, Sarah. Uh, and one, and two, and. Is that and three or and four? Oh, and it's one, and one, two, and three. <laughs> Sorry? And one, and three, and four, and one. Yeah, that's good. That's a simple path. Now, it turns out prime paths here would be as follows. And, and I, I'm not going to prove this here. And 0 and 1 and 3 and 4. Yeah, so and 0 and 1 and 2 is a prime path. Right. Turns out and 1 and 3 and 4 and 1, just like you said, is actually a prime path. It's not actually contained in any other prime path. Okay. Um, and uh, and 3 and 4 and 1 and 3. Similarly, uh, here, etc. Okay, now we're going to be coming up with paths for testing, abstract paths that cover those, that, that span those. And, and here, here's something that would span them, for example, if we went this one. And then if we went around this loop and 0 and 1 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2, these paths are the abstract paths that cover things, and those have to be from start to finish. Those have to be practical paths that run from the very start to the finish. So they have to go from N0 to N2. And here, they go N0 and 1 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2. Between that path T4 and path T3, which we just mentioned, those are going to cover all the prime paths. Now let me ask this. I want to make sure our understanding is solid. Path T4. Is path T4 a prime path? No. No, it's not. It's not a, how do we know it's not a prime path? Because there's loops in it and they don't, yeah. they aren't at the start and end. Yeah, good. But it's a perfectly valid path through the system. These things, T3 and T4, are not prime paths, but they are covering our prime paths. Just like before, we were trying to cover states, or before we were trying to cover transitions with paths through the system. Here we're trying to cover these prime paths. Right? There's a bunch of prime paths, and we're covering them collectively with these two. How come there's only two of these abstract paths that cover all these different prime paths? Because you actually do all those prime paths yeah. inside the... Yeah, exactly. I mean, this, this first one is hit by the, by the first one, right? By T3, the very first prime path up there. And the other prime paths are all hit by the second one, right? Like, like this guy... 
and zero and one and three and four is is right there, right? Uh, where is this guy? And four and one and three and four. Where's he? Well, there he is, right there. As long as it hits it, it's fine. As long as it goes through it, it's fine. We're trying to cover those guys, okay? Now, um, so these are the test paths, and they jointly satisfy coverage requirements, where the coverage requirements is covering all of the prime paths. Does that make sense? Okay, so time is too short to go into this. We'll cover this next time, but I will tell you this, that there's a turn the crank algorithm to identify prime paths. If you have a graph like this, or if you have a more complicated graph like this, you could plug it into this algorithm and turn the crank, and you could identify the prime paths in that algorithm. And those will probably give you a bunch of prime paths, and then your job will be to find paths through the system from start to finish that will cover those prime paths. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. yeah. And these prime paths are stronger things. They provide you they provide an extra level of rigor in testing that bumps you up from down here or down here, way above edge pair testing, all the way up to a much, much, much more rigorous level of testing. Is it exhaustive? Is it complete? No, it's not. But complete path coverage is normally logically impossible. You would not be able to cover every possible path through the system that could ever be taken. And I want you to think as a matter of prep for next time, why is it that complete path coverage, coverage every possible path through the system is typically impossible? I want you to think about that, okay? That it's impossible to guarantee that. But prime path gets us almost as good as we can get in terms of, of being able to, to cover at a practical level in a very efficient way. It, it gets us very far up here, I should say, okay? That'll be all for today. We'll go over that algorithm a little bit next time, and uh, then we'll talk about some further implications of, uh, of coverage testing, okay? Um, there have been teams in the past for this class that have sought to